All right, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 15 through 21, and then we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We're going to be talking about Pentecost and fire on the mountain. Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 15, it says, You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to Adonai. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ifha. They shall then be a fine flour baked with leaven at first fruits to, as first fruits to Adonai. Along with the bread, you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to Adonai with their grain offering and their drink offering, an offering made by fire and a soothing aroma to Adonai. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, one-year-old for a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before Adonai. They are to be holy to Adonai for the priest. On this same day, you shall make a proclamation as well. You are to have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It is to be a perpetual statute in all your dwelling places throughout all your generations. And then, as I said, the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. God operates according to a specific calendar built around seven feasts. This calendar is prophetic. This calendar is prophetic concerning the work of the Messiah. This calendar is prophetic according and, and, and describing the history of the world, pointing all the way up to the time of the establishment of the kingdom of the Messiah. The next appointment, remember almost, you know, over six weeks ago, we celebrated Passover or Pesach. The next appointment after Passover is 50 days, according to the Scripture, After the priest offered a sheaf of barley grain in the temple, a bundle of sheaf that they waved before God, brought in on the same day that Jesus was resurrected, for looking forward to the coming harvest that would begin to be celebrated at Pentecost. Now, we call it Pentecost because it means 50. But Judaism refers to it as the festival of Weeks. Literally, the word is Shavuot. They call it the Feast of Shavuot because it occurs seven weeks after the Passover. Now, Shavuot is the plural form of the Hebrew word Shavu. And Shavu literally means week or a period of seven days. Now, you might find this interesting. I certainly, certainly do. The time period of a week, according to the Scripture, is not marked by any natural phenomena in the created universe. Think about that. Days are marked by the rising and the setting of the sun. Months are marked by the phases of the moon, the lunar cycle. Years are marked by the position of the sun. But the time period of a week 
is not marked by any natural phenomena, but it is marked by the divine gift called Shabbat or Sabbath. The Hebrew meaning Shavu, when you add an A to it, Shavuah means week, and it's derived from the word that means seven. Now, we only know, according to the Scripture, when a week begins and when a week ends by taking account of the Sabbath. That's why a week is literally a gift of God's grace that was given to his people. In the same way, the reckoning of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is not marked by the sun, it's not marked by the moon, but it is uh, by observing the commandment that God gave to his people, the commandment of God's grace, by observing the seven Sabbaths that come after the Feast of Passover. As I said, Shavu, if you take the OT off and add a little dash and an A there, Shavua, it means a span of time made up of seven units. Now, that could be seven days. It could be seven years. It could be seven sabbatical years. Or it could be seven jubilee years. Seven sabbatical years is 49 years. Seven jubilee years would be 490 years. But nonetheless, it is a unit of seven. The Torah, the law of Moses that God gave him, the first five books, but in the commandments, particularly in Leviticus, it tells us to count both the days and the units of seven or weeks, which is why the festival is called Shavuot, their festival of weeks. He says in Leviticus 23, 15 and 16, you shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought out in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths, and you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to Adonai. Now, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, is directly linked to and connected to the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Pesach. Why did God command us to count the days from the festival of Passover or Pesach in order to determine when the Feast of Pentecost would begin? Well, one of the main reasons is because he's trying to show us that these two feasts are vitally connected. They are vitally tied together. You remember that Passover represented and was the, the celebration of God's people being set free and redeemed from slavery in Egypt. After all of their time of bondage there, the final judgment, the death of the firstborn, when God told them to take the blood of a lamb, put it over their doorposts, to feast and roast the lamb, to eat it, to eat unleavened bread, to have their sandals on, their, their, their staff in their hand, their robes ready to go because they were going to make haste and leave. This was a picture of God redeeming his people and setting them free from slavery. And we know that, again, all of these feasts, they, they, they point to the Messiah, we know that Passover pointed to the work of Messiah on the cross where he would shed his blood and that when we trust him by faith and confess him as our Lord and Savior, the blood, as it were, is applied to our lives. We are redeemed from slavery. We are set free from the bondage of sin. We are set free from the condemnation of the law. We are set free from slavery to the tyrannical Pharaoh, Satan. God redeemed his people according to Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. He says, let my people go that they may serve me. God wanted his people free because he wanted to enter into a covenant relationship with them at Mount Sinai. He wanted to take them under his wing and bring them into a land that he had promised them years before when he gave his covenant promise to Abraham. Why seven weeks and the 50th day? Well, one of the main reasons is this, that the period of time between Passover and Shavuot or Pentecost, it, is, it models the cycle of the Shemitah years. 
and the, of the Shemitah years and the year of Jubilee. Every seven years was a year of release. But ultimately, when you get to the year of Jubilee, that another cycle of seven, there is a remission of debt. All debts are paid, and the land goes back to its rightful owner. Everything, there is its restoration, and there is remission and removal of debt. And so every time... You are counting the weeks leading up to Pentecost. In your mind, you're also being reminded of the Shemitah, which is a cycle of seven years, a, a Sabbath, seven years of Sabbath years that comes up the seventh year, and of year of release, and then Jubilee, which is year of remission of debt and of everything being returned, the land to its rightful owner. And so in one sense, the Jubilee pictures the complete redemption of Israel and of God's people and the final day of salvation for all of creation in the world to come. It's pointing toward that time. And it's tied, all tied to what happened on Passover. It could not be possible without the sacrificing of the Lamb of God. And so this, the cycle between Passover and Pentecost is a yearly reminder, not only for the Jewish people, but for we in the Messiah. It is a yearly reminder for us to keep our eyes focused upon our final destination of where we are headed to eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you probably haven't thought about that. But again, this is why the celebration of these feasts is so important for the people of God, not just the Jewish people. And as I've told you in the weeks past, the early Gentiles who came into the body of Messiah celebrated these things with the Jewish people. They weren't, celeb they weren't celebrating them thinking they were, it was earning them any favor from God or anything like that. They were celebrating them because God said to do it. And not only that, but because they understood the significance of the eternal picture that they were presenting, the picture of the Messiah, the work of redemption. They understood these things until the enemy successfully moved in and began to strip us through a bunch of lies and deception and all kinds of other things of these wonderful treasures that God has given to us. And so we're reminded of our eternity that has come. Remember John wrote, and remember even Paul. You say, Paul, you know, Paul's the guy of grace. Paul's the guy of grace, the gospel of grace. Remember, he was leaving Asia Minor. He said, I have got to get back to Jerusalem for the feast of Shavuot. I have to get back for the feast of weeks. He was heading back and he was in a hurry to get back to celebrate this feast. And again, this is the man who talked to us about grace. He's telling us that, look, this is still a reminder of all so much of what is to come, but also of what is now. But John told us in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he said, Beloved, now we are the children of God, but it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. With the reality of what is coming in our eternity out there, we're reminded between Pesach and Shavuot. We're reminded of this future that's coming. We purify ourselves. We prepare ourselves living our lives in the light of what is coming Seven sets, seven units of seven. 49 years, 50th year being the Jubilee. Seven sets of seven, 49 days. The 50th day being the Feast of Pentecost. Now this feast is significant historically. Reason why it's significant. The first major event to ever happen on the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot was the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. 50 days after Israel had been freed from the bondage in Egypt. They come to Sinai, and now the Torah is given to them. Now, how does that 
that celebration, how, how, how is that time, how does it define this feast? Well, let's think of it like this. Let's think about this. Passover pointed to this fact, a people who are redeemed, okay? And people who have been redeemed are a people who have been, New Testament-wise, justified before God. Passover points to redemption. Redemption says you're justified before God. You are perfectly righteous before the Lord. This is what Messiah has done for us. Paul talks about this in Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5. But the feast of Shavuot points to this. Not only justified or, or redemption, Shavuot points to us being taught, which is Torah, or the word Torah means the instruction, taught, which then points to this, sanctification. Now, we've been justified, but now it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to begin to develop. And how do we begin to develop? By understanding the commandments of God and by being obedient to them. Passover not only points to the fact that we're redeemed, but Passover also gives us identity. Who are we? We are the people of God, purchased by the blood of the Lamb. But Shavuot tells us, you know, gives us instruction now. We're taught here, as Israel was given instructions at Sinai, it points to being instructed by God. This tells us who we are now, what's happened to us. This tells us what we are to do now. Israel had been redeemed, brought out and delivered. They come to Sinai. Now God says, okay, I've redeemed you. I've declared you my people. Now I'm going to teach you how to walk with me, how to live in relationship with me, and how to live in relationship with one another. And you are going to be a set-apart people for me. The Torah was given at Mount Sinai to instruct us how we are to serve God as his redeemed people. Listen, <clears throat> remember Jesus, if you go back to, and I just, I used this a few weeks ago, but if you go back to when Jesus was asked the big question, what is the greatest commandment, Master? Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? You know, I want to know what's the most important thing I need to know. Remember, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you've got these, these two commandments. You know, you've got loving God over here, and then you've got, you know, loving your neighbor over here. And remember what I showed you. All the commandments that are given, 613 of them, some say, probably some, there's debate about it, is that 613 or less? But anyway, the fact of the matter is every one of those things hang in one of these two categories, like a tree or like a Christmas tree. They're like ornaments on a tree. They, every single one of those commandments hang on those two things, loving God, loving your neighbor. If you go to the New Testament, and you read the commandments that are given there in the letters of Paul, Peter, James, John. Every one of those are statements that can be directly tied back into some commandment in the Torah. This is why Paul says that when you come to Messiah and you believe on him, especially as a Jew, he said the veil is removed away 
Whereas before the veil is over your eyes, you can't see Messiah in the Torah. You don't see him there. You're blind to it. But when you turn to the Lord, the Spirit moves the veil, and now all of a sudden, in Genesis you see him. In Exodus you see him. In Leviticus you see him. In Numbers you see him. In Deuteronomy you see him. In the prophets you see him. In the Psalms you see him. Everything opens up to you. You see him there. And so when we come to this time, God says, all right, I'm going to instruct you and show you how to live in relationship with me as my redeemed people. And we can only serve God as God intends for us to do when our lives are being conformed to his instructions. Remember, Paul told us this, and and the only way we can obey God's commandments that he gives to us is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot keep his commandments in our own strength. We can't keep our, his commandments in our natural state. We have to be born from above, made a new creation, the Spirit of God indwelling us and empowering us, enabling us to carry out and be obedient to the commands that he has given us. We can only do it through the power of the Spirit. This is why Paul told us in Romans 12, too, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world shape you and conform and and, and, and dictate to you the way you live. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Getting the old programming from the world out and putting the truth of God's instructions there as how God wants you to live. Conform to his instructions. And again, he said, you'll be able to do that which is good and acceptable and perfect before God. He said in Ephesians 2, 9 and 10, we are his workmanship created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we (coughs) should walk in them. I understand why, and, and especially in the last, you know, 25 years or so, there has been such an emphasis on grace. And, there were, and I understand because there had been a place and a point where, you know, religion had gotten into Christianity to a point where people were equating good works equals getting salvation and keeping it. you got to do this in order to get. But it's come to a point where the pendulum has swung to the way where now if anybody talks about doing good works, we look on that as, oh, legalism, 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 and that's not it. Listen, Paul says God created us in Christ to perform good works. Where do we find out what good works and good deeds are? Going to the Torah, going to the commands of Scripture. We find them there, and we learn what God is asking of us, but we know that we can't do any of those things except by the grace and the gracious working of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. The first major event that took place on Shavuot was the giving of the Torah. The second historical event, primary one, that took place on Shavuot was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Notice, when the day, not when the time period, but when the day of Shavuot, of Pentecost, had come. They were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak. Now, go back. Think for a second. Remember the significance of the first Shavuot, the first Pentecost at Mount Sinai. God steps down from the heavens. His presence comes and rests on Mount Sinai. The people at the base of the mountain see lightning, fire, smoke. They hear thunder and the loud sound of the ram's horn trumpet blowing. And the entire nation 
heard God speaking the Ten Commandments to them. They all heard it. Now, after that experience, they didn't want to hear anymore. They were like, no, no, Moses, you go listen to God. It's too scary of a thing. You, you, you go listen to him for us. Now, here's what's interesting. According to Jewish legend, when God spoke the Ten Commandments, his voice spoke in all of the languages of mankind. And it took the shape of fiery sparks that encircled the camp of Israel and came to rest on each individual Jew. Now, is that how it really happened? Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Just remember this. This legend was, a long, was around a long time before Peter, John, those other disciples experienced what they experienced on the day of Pentecost. Peter and all the other disciples and followers of Jesus were familiar with all of these Pentecost legends. They knew the stories. They knew the story of the words of fire resting on each person. They knew the story of God speaking and his voice speaking to all mankind in every language. Because remember, at the base of the mountain, in the midst of Israel, was a mixed multitude. It wasn't just Jews. Remember, there were a number of Egyptians and others who came out with them. Therefore, all the miracles, all the signs, all the wonders that came upon them on the day of Pentecost to them had deep significance because they could make some connections. God drew an unmistakable line between the giving of his Holy Spirit and the giving of his law and of his Torah. They could make the connection. They understood it, whereas many times we don't. Why? What is the significance of God giving and outpouring his Spirit? on the day of Pentecost. Now again, think about it. It tells us that later on there in Acts that men from every nation under heaven were in Jerusalem. And they heard the word of God in their own language as God was distributing these languages and these tongues of fire resting upon the different disciples. And they were declaring the wonders of God and people were hearing it in their own language. Jesus said in Luke 24, verses 48 and 49, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you were to stay in the city until you were clothed with power from on high. He said in Acts 1.8, before he ascended back to heaven, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. When Passover came, there was the whole idea, Passover, redeemed, free now to walk with and serve God. To serve God means that you can do something very unique and very special. To be able to serve God means that you can fulfill a prayer request of the Messiah in the Lord's Prayer. When you are redeemed and you are set free to serve God, you can then, in serving God, do this. You are sanctifying His name in all the earth. Remember what Jesus said to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. Literally, it means let your name be sanctified. Let it be set apart. How will his name be set apart? How will his name be made known? How will his nature and character be made known? Through his people. How is people going to do that? They have to be redeemed. They have to be redeemed because of the Passover lamb. They are able now to serve God. And in serving God, they are sanctifying his name by keeping his what? They're given Torah. 
But where's Torah now? Is it written on tables of stone? No, this is a fulfillment of the new covenant promise in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. Now the law, Torah, is written on their hearts. Now it's on their hearts. And now they understand and know the commandments of God. It's written there. It doesn't mean we don't study the scripture because we do. But what I'm saying is now our nature is, is in full harmony with his commandments. Our desire now is to be obedient to his commandments and to keep his commandments, his instructions. And how can we do that? We can only keep his commandments through the power of Holy Spirit who is given to us the moment we believe. He takes up residence within you and I. We are to sanctify the name of of the Messiah by being his witnesses in and to all of the nations on the earth. And we become this by living in union and communion with him, abiding in him. He said to abide in him in John 15, and in in our abiding with him, we will produce much fruit. He will produce the fruit actually through you and I. The festival of Shavuot reminds us that you and I are to be constantly living in and being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Every day, filled with His Spirit, led by His Spirit, walking in the Spirit. You understand, this is why Paul talks about this in Galatians, in Ephesians, in Colossians, in Philippians. He is emphasizing the importance of our dependence in Romans on the spirit of the living God who has taken up and been given to us and taken up residence in us. He empowers you and I to be effective witnesses for the Messiah in the way that we live our life and the fruit that our life bears, that other people see the evidence. They see the fruit of God in our lives. We cannot live the Christian life without being full of the Spirit of God and empowered by Him. Let me think about this. Ask yourself this question. Are you committed to sharing the good news about the Messiah to other people and living it in front of them and not being tight-lipped or silent about it? One of the significant marks of the fullness of the Spirit is boldness. You're able to declare and speak boldly in the name of the Lord. Are you doing as Peter admonishes us in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify Messiah as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence? Are you preparing yourself to be ready to give an answer to people who will ask you about the hope that you have that is within you? Ah, they have to see it. They have to know that you have this hope and see the evidence of it in our lives as we live among them. Let's think about this and summarize it all together. You and I were redeemed at Passover in order to know, to love, and to live in union with and to be able to serve God and honor him, being obedient to his commands. And Jesus said, look, if you love me, You keep my commandments. You know, you are my friends if you do what I've asked you to do. Now, think about that. What if your friendships were based on that? If you said, well, I'll be your friend, but only if you do what I tell you to. Now, that's what Jesus said. You're my friends if you do what I ask of you. We're redeemed. The giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai on the first feast of Shavuot. It was God's instructions in righteousness, how to live a righteous life. It tells us how we are to serve him. Again, if you read through Paul and Peter, James, John, Jude, these brothers, they are reiterating and restating just in different ways, many times to Gentile believers, what Torah has already stated. But again, framing it for them in their particular culture, in their particular way of life. But again, you go back and you look and you can find Messiah. You can find a way of life that honors and brings pleasure to God. We know him 
We love him. We serve him. We are his image bearers. So we talked about last year, his image bearers representing him to the world. So the world knows who he is and what he's like. Serving him and knowing him and all of those reasons is the primary reason for which he has redeemed us from slavery and Passover and then at Pentecost given us the power of his Holy Spirit. We're empowered by his indwelling spirit to be witnesses for Jesus. Jesus doesn't give us the Holy Spirit for us to run around acting like fools. Listen, anytime you see anybody saying, oh, you know, they're, they're acting like they're drunk and they're acting like you know, a fool, they're stumbling around, they're barking like a dog or howling like some animal or something like that, you can rest assured they're not full of the Holy Spirit. They're full of a spirit but not the Holy Spirit. One of the main evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is self-control. And the fact is, when we are full of the Spirit of God, we are bearing testimony to the Messiah in our life and with our lips. Do you have that mission, that desire as a priority in your life every day of living for him before the world as a testimony and a witness? How in touch are you with the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life personally? How in touch are you with the leading of the Holy Spirit in your family that you're following the instructions of the Spirit of God and how you lead your home, dad, husband. How you raise your kids or how you, how you treat or raise your, or with your grandchildren, how you relate to your family. How in touch with the Holy Spirit are you in that respect in the life of your community? Are you being led by him? You see, Shavuot follows the pattern of the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, but also of the Jubilee year, seven sevens. And remember, it emphasizes to us when we reflect on it, eternity, the age to come, olam haba, the age that is out there, the world to come. Are you living your life with eternity in view? Not just the present moment. It's fine to live in the moment, as they say, but you live in the moment with an eye toward that day. Paul kept referring many times to that day, that day, that day, that day. Living his life in relationship to it. Are you anticipating the return of Messiah? Are you longing for it? Spirit of God within you, filling you and empowering you, sanctifying you, setting you apart in order to sanctify his name, creates in you as well a longing and a desire to see Jesus. As Peter said, whom having loved you have not seen, and though you have not seen him still, you rejoice with hope and joy unspeakable, receiving as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. You're longing to see him and be with him. How does that affect your priorities in life every day? How about the choices that you make? How about your ability and your desire, to what we talked about a few weeks ago, to persevere? Yes, you are going to be preserved, no doubt, by his grace. But there's also the flip side of preserve, it's persevere, hanging in there. And the only way we can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. First and foremost, the question you have to answer is, have you experienced Passover yet? Have you experienced being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you received the forgiveness of your sins? Have you entered into that reality? And in entering that reality, in the moment you do, have you experienced Shavuot, being full of his spirit, being empowered by his spirit? And are you as a child of God seeking to live daily and be led by Holy Spirit and living in the light of eternity? That is moving ever so quickly toward us all. We celebrated Passover here weeks ago. Had a Passover meal. It was a great time. Uh, we had talked about doing something for Shavuot. Well, first and foremost, I'm not here. But secondly, the way it's generally celebrated, probably a lot of you might not want to do that. It ends up you staying up all night, literally, during the feast. You stay up from like 8 o'clock in the night until 8 o'clock the next morning and all through the night. You're reading the scriptures. You're praying. 
you're singing, you're fellowshipping, and just continually going through that until the next morning with a lot of celebration and then going to bed, I think, at 8 o'clock the next morning. Probably a lot of you won't do that. But let me, let me tell you, you can celebrate it by remembering the Spirit being given, by your heart being desirous to obey His commands, acknowledge the fact that you have been given the Spirit, and live moment by moment by being led by the Spirit of God in your life. Let's pray. Father, as we close this time, we pray for anyone who is listening, Yeshua, who has never trusted you as their Passover lamb. And we pray that maybe you would just open their hearts up to see their need for you as their Messiah, to have their sins and experience the reality of their sins being forgiven, be made a new creature, and that they will experience the coming of the Spirit in that moment. Passover, Pentecost, boom, experienced in the same moment. The Spirit of God taking up residence within them. and May they be led by Him. May we as your children who are listening live in the power of the Spirit And may we live our lives with an eye towards eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.